ending the coronavirus pandemic and climate change. That's what G7 leaders are currently discussing. The United States has promised 500 million doses, while J&J &J has also promised another 100 million shots. That's after the FDA ordered that over 50 million doses be discarded following possible contamination at the Emergent Biosolutions plant in Baltimore. At the same time, over $1 billion has been pledged towards the Global Partnership for Education. Honorary Professor of International Relations at Wits University, Professor John Stremlang, joins me now to discuss this further. Prof, always a pleasure speaking to you. It appears as though the G7 summit has its eyes cast on a post-COVID global economy. Now, with the pledge we've seen of about a billion doses of vaccines being donated to poorer countries, is it a case that the West has come to its senses? Or was it more of a push by the rest of the, the world? <laughs> well, it's a little bit of both. You know, at the, at the first instance, uh, uh, Joe Biden is back and he's not Donald Trump. So the whole climate in uh, Cornwall is different than it's been for the last four years at these G7 summits. And they have had COVID as the number one issue. I'm very, very glad Cyril Ramaphosa is there to represent Africa and Africa's aspirations for enough vaccines. The WHO has said that, uh, you know, the pledge that the, uh, of, the, of the billion uh, inoculations is not anywhere near enough, that uh, we need a lot more than that, and uh, that will come over time. But I also think that uh, Cyril Ramaphosa's appeal um, for the lifting of the, of the patent rights on the drug so that uh, countries can produce more locally is extremely important. Mm. But also, you know, Cyril Ramaphosa represents a diverse democracy from the South, and one of the sub-themes in all of this is China. China's given uh, vaccines to 95 countries. China's building the Belt and Road Initiative, and there's a big in, uh, infrastructure initiative that the G7 is talking about now. And I think it's very healthy that there is competitiveness because that gives Africa choices. And I'm so glad that Cyril Ramaphosa is there to represent Africa. Yeah. Let's speak about uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa. I mean, as you're saying, he's pushing for the patent wave on COVID-19 vaccines. On the other side of it, we've got, uh, you know, the G7 countries that are pledging one billion uh, doses of the vaccine to, uh, to poorer countries. Then the question is, will they hear the president speak on these uh, on this patent waiver or does it even make business sense for uh, those G7 countries to actually you know waiver the patent and and provide you know more uh, developing countries an opportunity to produce the vaccine sounds like if I'm giving you a billion doses of the vaccine why do I need to give you the patent well again the the um, uh, the, the, the WHO thinks we need 11 billion uh, doses and for the world to be inoculated by what the, tar what the G7 is talking about by the end of next year. Uh, there are so many, many, many questions about the logistics and getting this rollout going. Mm -hmm. I do think it's very positive that the G7 is talking about rooting these drugs through COVAX, which does have an infrastructure and some uh, ability to, 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 uh, to help countries uh, solve the logistics and other problems. But I do think it's important for uh, Cyril Ramaphosa to be there to advocate along with India, which is also uh, an observer to this uh, conference and also a very complex democracy, as you know, from the South, uh, to argue for um, the, the TRIPS uh, waiver of, uh, that we've heard so much about but for the, um, the, the World Trade Organization so that you can get these things produced locally and quickly because the uh, urgency is, as we know from here with the third wave, is enormous. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about this post-COVID uh, economy. U.S. President Biden is rallying to impose a 15 percent tax, minimum global tax on multinational corporations. Is it likely to go through and will the proposal actually be welcomed back in America? Oh, yes, it certainly will be uh, welcomed. I'm, I'm speaking for myself now. Uh, I'm sure there'll be detractors, but uh, the, this is a big, big, big step forward. And I'm so glad that the G7 has shown that they're willing to act collectively and to do this. It's got to be implemented, yes. So each country's got to proceed with the, the, the pledges that have been made. But it's a huge breakthrough because in a digital age, what companies are doing are locating where they can avoid taxes. We know this. And I know T Tabo and Becky chairs this uh, high-level panel of the ECA and the AU on illicit financial flows. This is only the start of recovering what we all know are, are taxes that are being held, held and uh, held back and, and hidden 
uh, by relocating uh, uh, offices in, in convenient locations where no tax bill is paid by the likes of Apple and the big companies of, of Google and the like. And it's, it's, it's just scandalous, and, and this is the beginning. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit, Prof, about the politics of sports. Could we expect the Tokyo Olympics to take place, even with what is understood, as resistance in Japan just due to the number of COVID-19 cases? Well, I don't know what's going to happen there. Uh, we, we're all reading the same uh, uh, press reports. But I do think it's important to, to, to point out, that, that, as you have, that you've got to be prepared for more pandemics. Uh, we have not um, seen the international community pulling together, uh, and this is, this is our, the cost of this is being shown right now with vaccine diplomacy and vaccine nationalism. And, and it's, it's really incumbent upon uh, the countries of the world. And again, I'm awfully glad that, uh, that India and South Africa are at, represented at this G7 summit and mm -hmm. at the G30 to, to realize that we've got to get collective action on these major threats like pandemics, like climate change. It's a different agenda than I ever studied international relations, but it is the crucial one going forward in the 21st century. And before we leave you, Prof, let's ask you this very quickly. How much of an ear is paid to developing countries such as South Africa when it comes to these summits? Do they actually listen to these countries or do they just smile and nod? Well, there, there was a, a talk a lot that, that the G7 is just talk shop. It's not, 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 not institutionalized. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think it's extremely important at a time when China and Russia are saying that democracies are only for small, rich European countries and they simply cannot man, uh, operate to the satisfaction of people who um, are tired of authoritarian regimes and, and, but get used to authoritarian regimes. And, and, and Xi and, and Putin are there for life. And South Africa has known what authoritarianism is. So has India. So mm -hmm. is Indonesia. And these, these countries have got to learn how to show the world that, that the democracies can flourish in the South. And that's why I think it's extremely important for Cyril Ramaphosa to be there, bearing witness to all the problems we have, but saying that we're coming to terms with those problems and he's going to lead the way forward. And I hope he does. Professor John Stremler, always a pleasure. Thanks a lot for joining us this evening.